Great. All right. Similar to the last talk, this is going to be a string of videos. So this is kind of like having the substitute teachers in for the class. Um, so kind of sit back and relax and enjoy. Uh, what we're going to talk about is projection mapping. So projection mapping used to be called spatial augmented reality. Uh, and it's a technology where you can go ahead and hit play. Where we take uh, everyday projectors, just like the projector that's displaying this video. I think it's not playing. There we go. All right. Uh, so projection mapping is where you take everyday video projectors, like the one that we're seeing today, and instead of pointing it at a flat screen, you point it at something that's not flat. That's a 3D object. Why should you trust me? Because uh, I've been doing it for about nine years at Disney, at Microsoft, and at other places. Why not use a headset? Well, the biggest reason is if you have a lot of people, you need a lot of people to experience magic at the same point in time. And so that's why I use projection mapping. Uh, this used to be called spatial augmented reality. Then about 2008, artists in the media decided it was projection mapping. The first known instance of this was at Disney's Haunted Mansion ride. Um, that was in 1969 using analog video projectors. Then in 1980, Michael Neymark put an analog film projector on a turntable and then filmed a room, spray painted everything white, and then reprojected the room back onto itself. This was then picked up by Ramesh Roskar at UNC, uh, who kind of invented the math behind projection mapping, so scanning 3D objects and then using 3D models to uh, do the projection. Uh, then about 2008, this started to be used for building projections. Um, so this is projecting onto the Sydney Opera House um, from Obscura Digital. This is Bon Jovi concerts. Um, this was on Twitter this morning, so I threw it in. Um, this is called Sonet Lumiere Shows, uh, which is really popular in Europe. Uh, this is Redwood City. So, you know, two towns over, um, there's projection mapping every Tuesday night to draw traffic into downtown Redwood City. Besides projecting on buildings, this is being used in theater and live performances. So we have uh, American Idol and we have uh, the Super Bowl with Katy Perry two years ago. Um, it's, you know, San Jose Sharks have projection mapping. It's used in Broadway theater productions. It's used for viral YouTube videos. Uh, this was Bot and Dolly's Box. And it can be used in retail. So besides just doing events, you can take projectors. And here they're in nice little white boxes. And then they're projecting information into stores. So you have little birds hopping around a store. Um, you can take physical printed things, and you can animate them. We call this glitter for products. So the idea is attracting attention to a product. Someone's going to walk up and touch that product. They touch it. They're 70% more likely to buy it. You can just change the price for every product. So same thing you can do with a TV. You can do with projection. You can do this for different product categories. So consumer electronics, fashion, perfumes. Nike's done this about four times. Um, you know, Nail polish. You can use Connects to make it interactive. So when you pick up a product, the visuals change. Besides inside of stores, you can use this in storefront windows. So this is Fabergé egg um, at Harrods that's in the front window using, uh, I think, six really expensive projectors. So it works during the daytime. Um, this is another version of tennis shoes done by Buckfeet. Um, and besides projecting directly onto the product, you can project onto the set that's kind of surrounding that product for visual merchandising. You can also make it big. So you can do um, what you used to do with caves, um, where you can just project onto kind of arbitrary surfaces. This was a cool project at, by Microsoft, where they built this giant playground uh, with Microsoft products. And then you could sit inside of it, use the products, and then everything was kind of subtly animated. This was for Spotify. They took a wall of products, they painted them white, and then they projected animations on top of them. Um, so, like, there's a uh, butcher um, knife that's animated on top of the actual knife. It's used in architecture for, uh, like, pre-visualization techniques. Um, if you guys haven't seen the sand table, there's a sand table used for kind of landscaping um, and uh, studying water flow in the other room. Uh, so this was Google um, doing more architectural visualizations. You can use it in retail for more ambiance applications, so not just on products, but on entire kind of wall displays. These are paper cutouts that are then pasted onto the wall and then subtly animated with projection. You can display information around a product that explains certain features, um, and then you can do that by combining printed graphics with the projected light. 
You can do this in rear projection in addition to front projection. So this is a rear projected version of a virtual assistant. Uh, you might see that in like an airport or a train station. And then going to where we're at today, uh, expos and trade shows, uh, basically every single car when it comes out, it's launched with, with projection mapping. Um, so this is a Jaguar, uh, and then we're about to see a Land Rover's version of this. You still don't see this technology in dealerships, right? But you see it in trade shows. It's also used in other kinds of events. So this is New York Fashion Week, or launching the new StarCraft. Or you go to Disney World and you pay $3,000 to have a magical wedding cake. So you have Tinkerbell that flies around your cake, or you have the happy couple's initials that get drawn onto the cake, or my favorite version, Pac-Man cake. It can be used in restaurants. So the first example, Le Petit Chef, is in the other room as well. Um, so this was done by Skull Mapping, and they have a little chef who cooks a virtual steak on your plate while you wait for your dinner. Uh, this technology is kind of replacing TVs. So if you think about Dunkin' Donuts, Dunkin' Donuts has four TVs that are the menus. Starbucks and every other cafe does not. That's because they don't want to look like Dunkin' Donuts. So what you can do with projection is you can make menus that seamlessly blend into the aesthetics of a space. You can use this in museums. So you can educate and inform. You can take uh, existing sculptures from Michelangelo's day and animate them. You can take uh, you know, models of cities and put information on top of them. And this can be interactive, so you can use depth sensors to uh, enable multi-touch on any surface. Moving to art. So we're going to look at a bunch of examples of combining printed things with projected things. So not just using a white screen, but using a colored screen. So here they took a bunch of cutouts um, that they printed, they pasted them on a wall, and then they did these subtle black and white animations. What you get here is you get really high resolution because printed things have really high resolution, but then you get to animate them with projection. You can go really big. So instead of printing, you can paint. You can paint a mural on the side of a building. And then you can animate it. So as I was saying, uh, you can combine printed elements with projection that are very high resolution. Uh, the other version of that is wallpaper. So you can just put up vinyl decals and then subtly animate them with projection. Digital wallpaper that's connected to the internet. You can imagine a version of this where you have your Twitter feed on it as well. So besides being ambiance, you can have practical information. This is one of my favorites. This is a bar. Um, and they have a magical enchanted forest in the bar that's subtly animated. This is a version by Johnny Le Mercier where he uh, used markers to draw uh, like a, a mountain and then animate it with projection. Um, you can do it on paintings. Um, this, you can do it in corporate lobbies, which is what this is. Going back to Johnny Le Mercier. And if you're feeling ambitious, you can rent a generator and you can take your projectors into a forest. Uh, so you can project onto trees, you can project onto mushrooms, you can project onto frogs. This project was done by Threehund. Uh, it's two guys from Germany. Um, and they spent a month uh, in a forest shooting this, um, setting up little IKEA tables and projectors and generators. But the effect is quite magical. This is a project we at Lightform did with Gmunk, uh, who's the animator that did the Tron opening sequence and the default Windows logo. We created a sculptural element out of, uh, it was a CNC'd uh, material, 
uh, and then we animated that with projected light, and this was at a gallery in San Francisco. You can have a painting of the Bay Lights, uh, of the Bay Bridge, that's animated via an ultra short throw projector. Um, this is actually a demo that's in our office. You can also animate people. So this is a cool project where they took people's existing tattoos and then they did motion graphics on top of them. The one downside is you have to wear very little clothes when you make this effect work. And moving into the future, you can make these experiences completely interactive. So this is a recent project from Disney where they're tracking uh, an actor's face and then putting makeup on it in real time. This project from Microsoft where you wear a projector on your shoulder and you can turn any surface, uh, a wall, your hand into a phone. And so you can dynamically take over anything in the real world and turn it into a screen. Uh, this was my work at Microsoft called the Loom Room. The idea is you take a projector, you put it on your coffee table, and you point it at the TV you already own. Now the game comes out of the TV and it comes into your living room. So you can have bullets that fly out of the screen and into your living room. This actually got a 3D model of your living room, so you could do things like um, project on top of your existing furniture and compensate for the existing color and geometry. So you turn your 50-inch TV into a 15-foot TV. You can do things like you get shot in the video game and your living room gets shot. It wobbles, shakes, and explodes. You can have it snow in a video game and the snow collects on your bookshelf, on your plants, using a physics simulation in your living room. And moving to a bigger version of that, we did Microsoft's Room Alive project, which was instead of one projector, we have six. So now every square inch of your living room becomes a game. So here we have whack-a-mole, like the arcade game, but the moles pop out of your walls, your floor, your couch, and you literally run around and hit them with your hands, with your feet, or with a gun, um, which was an infrared LED that we were tracking. Um, there was six projectors and six connects. So every person within this room was tracked. So you could do head tracking. You could do view-dependent rendering um, from any person in the room. Uh, and we could also detect multi-touch, both from your hands, from your feet, or you could even use objects like a pillow. Um, so you could grab a pillow to you know, throw it at another player, and that could be actually part of the game. Some really wonderful acting in this video, by the way. Here we have a soldier. The soldier is climbing down your wall, across your entertainment center, and across the floor. Um, this effect was head tracked, so without wearing anything on your face, you can render a 3D object in the scene um, because the system knows where the person's head is. We call this one Indiana Jones. So the idea is you're searching for an idol and you're going around your living room and there's traps, and the traps get sprung based upon your location in the room and you have to dodge them and have really bad acting. As this character is running across the room, uh, we're using the normals of the 3D geometry to figure out where he should be oriented. You can also do things like uh, toss a tennis ball back and forth between two people. So here we're tracking the hands of the person in real time. Um, this is cool work by Ishikawa's lab where you're projecting onto uh, super high frame rate um, uh, capture of people and then reprojecting on top of them. A little bit about how you do projection mapping. Well, how you do projection mapping today is you use video-based tools like After Effects, and you can use projection mapping tools like Mad Mapper, D3, et cetera. You usually have a, like a grid, and you have to warp your content onto uh, the, kind of the building that you're projecting onto. Basically, it's a horrible process, which is why we invented Lightform. Lightform is a camera and a computer all in one. It turns any projector, including the one we're using today, into a 3D scanner. You take Lightform, you point it at any object, and within seconds, you have magic that exists in the real world. So we use those same kind of effects we did at Disney and at Microsoft, and you can, within a single click, um, make the edges of objects glow and pulse to music, for instance. Where this technology really becomes interesting is when projectors go from being ugly to really tiny, which is going to happen within the next three years. If you want to learn more about projection mapping, go to our blog, projection-mapping.org. And then we end on which future do you want to live in, which is do you want to be surrounded by screens, or do you want to be able to, through projection, turn any object in the real world into a display, but more importantly, be able to turn it off. And with that, I think we're exactly at 15 minutes.
Is there a question? Can you make that video available? Uh, yeah, talk to me afterwards, and I can just give it to you. Yeah, so Lightform works with any projector. So it actually just talks to the projector over the HDMI cable. Um, so it's a smart add-on for a $200 Pico or a $100,000 projector for projecting on the side of a building. All right, with that, we'll get to the last talk. <laughs>